What's up, everyone? I'm Dub Jelson, and I'm here with a Purdue football legend, Corey Sheets. Corey, how you doing? Marty, so what's going on, Dub? Nothing much, man. Just living life. Uh, so where you come from right now? Right now, I'm in Tampa, Florida. Tampa, Florida. Um, so I know I saw on your Instagram recently that you got a they got surgery. How's that recovery process going for you? Uh, it sucks. I, I re herniated my disc. So it, it, yeah, I basically just started over from scratch. <laughs> uh, how'd you how'd you do that? I honestly don't even know to be honest with you. I went back for another MRI, and uh, it looked the same as when I first had it. Doctor's mm-hmm. like, uh, yeah, you re-herniated your disc, so uh, what you want to do? <laughs> like, I'm done with surgery. <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, that's good uh, for sure. I know you got surgery in, like, March 2nd around that time. Are you glad you kind of got it done during this whole quarantine pandemic nonsense? Uh, yes, I am, because it happened, like, literally, like, two weeks before everything shut down. So I was happy I was able to get in there. Mm-hmm. And it was this, when did you first hurt it? Was it when you were still playing? Uh, no, I was in uh, two car accidents at the, uh, at the end of uh, 19 and then down at the Super Bowl in February. So that's when it, that's when you think that probably happened? Oh, no, that's definitely when it happened, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so how's, how are you feeling right now? Uh, I'm feeling all right. I'm going, getting ready to go home, go relax. End of the day. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, how have you been handling this whole pandemic? Um, I don't, I don't know how long, how much longer it'll last. Uh, COVID probably here to stay for for the foreseeable future. But how have you kind of been handling it? Um, and how's it impacted you personally? Um, I'm a homebody, so staying at home wasn't really a, an adjust for me. It was my mm-hmm. normal day, my normal everyday life. So, <clears throat> it didn't really affect me too much. Um, some people in my family members, they lost some jobs and things like that. That's pretty much how it's all affected me. But uh, it's been pretty cool. There's, there's no cars on the road. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm, in, I'm in Indiana still, and uh, things, are, things are opening back up for us. Um, it's kind of back to normal, but with all the precautions and stuff like that. I know a big, um, a big talk <clears throat> point recently, especially in the sports world, is if and when – and how the NFL and college football are going to resume. So do you think that, uh, specifically college football, do you think that they'll be back as normal, like without fans and all the precautions, or do you think they'll, they'll end up canceling the season or postponing it to the spring? I think they should postpone it to the spring. I don't think they should cancel cancel the season, or at least winter, winter, spring, or however mm-hmm. they want to do it, but – I don't think they should cancel the season because a lot of guys' lives could be dependent on this season, mm-hmm. and things of that nature, as far as the sports world. But if things do don't get back, I'll say clear back or back to normal. It's no rush, to be honest with you. I'd rather the world be safe than be, be in a rush to watch a football game. Mm-hmm. So. And that's about how. If you do, if you do push the season to the spring, how's that going to impact the guys that are going to potentially go to the draft, like for Purdue, Rondell Moore, or guys like Trevor Lawrence or Justin Fields? So, do you think that they'd probably sit out the season if that were the case? Oh man, it's hard because again, you you might need that season to show scouts that you you are healthy for a whole season, or you can be healthy for a whole season, or you can be consistent for two, three seasons. So it's it's a sticky situation. You gotta you gotta play the play the game the best way you know how because it's it's a business at that point. It's no longer you're just doing this for fun, but your your, your livelihood is dependent on it. So if if playing half the season to help, uh, I, I, that might work. But I, I don't, it's a, that's a sticky situation. Each guy's situation is going to be different, so there's no telling what may happen. <laughs> yeah, I mean. The whole world is kind of just crazy now in terms of just not only COVID, but everything else. Um, how important do you think it is for not only the athletes, but the fans and the students and people that work for Purdue uh, that there is a season or any college in general? How important do you think that is for, for them? Honestly, not really, because 
the money that's brought in through through sports is extra. Everything through through college is pretty much the tuition based stuff. But I honestly, do, I really don't think sports is really that important right now because I'm down in Florida, and if you've been paying attention to the map, this is one of the places that spiked and we opened up pretty early. So, mm-hmm. and I work kind of in the medical field. And seeing people in these hospitals day in and day out is is, is not cool. So, I, in my opinion, I, I'd rather we stay shut down for a little bit longer, like the rest of the world did, because they, they got it under control. We don't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're kind of the only country that's it's kind of expanded to these numbers and these percentages of people that have gotten it. Um, so, how has it been in Florida with all this going on? Did is it just kind of a free for all? It kind of felt like that at the beginning, like the beaches were still open and, and things of that nature? Uh, not really, because they did close the beaches down when, then, when when the world shut down for a moment, but it was just, we opened up so fast, I think. That's mm-hmm. what, what was the, the bad thing, because I went out to California for uh, not too long ago for a little while, and just being in Florida, I kind of forgot that the rest of the world wasn't, wasn't open, so when I got and called my friends, I was like, what's going on? Let's hang out. They was like, man, COVID's still going on. What you talking about? And I, I'm like, man, I done forgot. I done, I'm coming from Florida. We going to the beaches. People going to the bars and clubs are open and stuff. So <laughs> it was kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of different when you step outside of Florida. Mm, yeah, for sure. Um, so, like I mentioned, you uh, played for Purdue, and you're a legend in uh, in a lot of Boilermakers fans' eyes. Uh, how do you think, what was the culture like when you were at Purdue and how do you think it's kind of evolved as time's gone on and there have been different coaching changes? It's been a while since I've been back, but the culture is like any other culture anywhere. You want to win. And you got to work hard and, and play hard and, and you got to grind to get those wins out. So that's pretty much was the culture when I was there. It was no sort of pavement and work. Mm-hmm. But as far as nowadays, I, I haven't been back, so I couldn't honestly couldn't tell you that question. Is there a reason you haven't been back? Or have you just not uh, had the time? Not having the time, life getting away. Say I'm, I've been trying to get back. I actually was uh, scheduled to come to the um, spring game this year, <laughs> but uh, it got canceled. Oh, uh, you were? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, the reason I asked that is because I had Bernard Pollard on the podcast a couple weeks ago, or last <laughs> week and he was talking about how he had a falling out with uh the late joe tiller so he hasn't been back since he was there which was like 0405 so i didn't know if there's any situation like that with you but no nah, uh rest of soul joe passed away but uh i didn't really i wouldn't say we was a uh, we was friends but uh i was able to come back <laughs> i was there yeah. when uh when Benalla, <laughs> when, 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 when I left uh, we left kind of differently, I would say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, how do you kind of look back at your time at Purdue and all the friendships, all the friendships that you made that you kept throughout the years, and how it propelled you to uh, play at the pro level as well? Um, what's crazy? I used to tell people this all the time. Is like when I was at Purdue, I would tell you I hated it. I hated it. Didn't want to be there. Couldn't wait till I left. But then, like, I got older and I would be talking to people about things that went on at Purdue. And it, like, hit me, like, I had a good time there. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of the people that I met there, I'm still very close friends with today. So, I don't, I don't think I would have changed it for anything, to be honest with you. It was a it was a good time at Purdue. And it, it did get me to the next level, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, why, did, why would you say that you hated it? Like, I asked you that back when – back when you were playing there? Just because I probably wasn't getting the ball at the time. You know, running backs always went the ball and produce a pass, pass, first pass, second pass, third school. Mm-hmm. That's that's probably why I was saying I didn't like it, but I left there with most of the records under my, under my belt, so I ain't do too bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's you and All-Star are the two, two greatest Purdue running backs, in my opinion. Um, I don't think there's anyone else uh, that can compare to you guys. But how do you think Purdue um, helped you during your pro football career and then beyond that? Um, one thing that Joe preached to me, like he was always in my head, was being consistent. 
And when you get to the next level, you're only as good as your last play. So mm. if you string together a bunch of inconsistent plays or you're spotty, that's not something that's liked in the league. So being consistent helped me helped me excel my career the way it did because no matter where I went, I always played my best at, at a higher level. So I think that's what made me good where I was. Mm -hmm. And then what about after after football ended for you? Um, did you kind of take anything that you learned at Purdue and translate it to the, the real world, not just on the football field? Uh, not honestly, because when I stopped playing football, it was kind of a, an abrupt moment mm -hmm. for me. So I was kind of in the lost place and where I'm, I'm just now working to come out of it, I would say. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, after football, like life experiences, I really didn't have many because it was all football, football, football. So I'm just now getting real life experience. Mm -hmm. And I, w I did want to talk about that. But before we talked about that, um, you had two stints in the NFL. I know the first one didn't end too well um, because of the yeah, injury. Neither one of them did. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what, what were some of your takeaways um, during those two stints? Like, what were those experiences like? Um, it opened my eyes to a, a different way of life and a different type of football. You had to had to be more of a student than just an athlete. And then it also showed me the business side of the game, <clears throat> which I kind of enjoyed mm -hmm. when I was in it. So I just wish I could have stayed a little bit longer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so then in, betwe in between those two since you played in the CFL and you – balled out um you had so much success there won a won a great cup what what were those experiences like and how did it compare to your time in the nfl uh completely different i didn't get injured for one yeah. <laughs> when i did it wasn't that bad but uh going to the cfl was the only thing i would say that was different as far as the league would was be being in a different country that was something that i had to get used to and it's a lot more peaceful, I would say, in Canada than it is down here. <laughs> yeah, I would assume so. Um, what were the fans any different? Like at the games, were they uh, a little quieter? Maybe not as no, no. They're, they're they're just as fanatic about their teams as any other fanatic <laughs> across the world. Uh -huh. You still get cussed out, beer thrown at you, as long as you got on the wrong colors. <laughs> So the fans are the fans are great up there in the CFL. I wouldn't trade them. Mm -hmm. And then one thing I wanted to ask you was, I know down in the states, um, we I mean a lot of people don't really watch the CFL a whole lot. Do you think that foot, like American football fans, NFL fans, do you think they kind of look down upon the CFL as um, like a step below the NFL or like a like a minor leagues per se or something like that? Because I know a lot of people don't, I mean, don't follow. Yeah, a lot of people just don't know about it, to be honest with you. Like, I had never heard of it outside of knowing that Ricky Williams went up there to Canada and played for a team. Like, I didn't even know the team that he went and played for. Like, I was on his, I was teammates with him. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, I just think a lot of Americans just don't know about the game because the, the time that I was playing and it was showing it on ESPN a lot, I know people like enjoyed it, and uh, I like I ran into people that recognized me from those games from watching it down here. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think if they just got a little bit more TV TV time, it'd be a lot. It'd, it'd probably be taken in a lot better because the game is just a tiny game. Like it's kind of like the college game. The, the, the game's fast and it is a high pace. And it's a big, a lot of scoring. So I think American Americans would like it if they got a chance to see it more. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we saw with the XFL, they kind of they had a little bit of success um, at the beginning, but then it kind of fell off, and then the whole pandemic happened. So, I don't know. I don't think they'll ever come back. But um, do do you think that you enjoyed your time there more than you did in the NFL? That might be a dumb question, considering how you answered the past ones. No, I, I, I get I get that question. But I wouldn't say I enjoyed it more. It was just I got to play. <laughs> so that that was really the, the main difference because not like being in the NFL and, and working 
all week just to go watch the game on Sunday is like it's heartbreaking at the end of the week. You walk into a locker room and see your names on that inactive list. It's just like <sighs> again this week, like I got a real good ticket to the game. Like <laughs> Yeah. Um so fast forward to twenty fourteen when you were with the Raiders in the preseason. You tear your and then you're pretty much forced to retire um, after that point just because of the devastating fashion of the injury. Uh, did you have trouble kind of accepting the fact that you'd no longer be able to play? Um, it wasn't even the fact that I, the, the, the injury or what it was. It was the, the doctor that I had fix it. He didn't fix it. So if if I had I had got my uh, Achilles fixed the correct way the first time, I probably wouldn't have. No, I'm probably I wouldn't have been able to. Uh, I would have been able to play again because just because of the timing wouldn't have matched up. Like, all right, you got two years off from one injury. It's time to move on. So that's mm-hmm. that. That pretty much was the stigma with me. Mm-hmm. Do you know what what exactly he did that uh, wasn't right? Like, probably not in medical terms, but you know, uh, like generally what happened. So basically, when you, you tear your Achilles, it becomes overstretched. Then it pops. And your Achilles is like a rubber band. So once the rubber band is too stressed, there's no more elasticity in it. So what he was supposed to do was shorten the, the Achilles and so to make my calf tight. But all he did was just repair it and sew them back together. So it still was around there like this, mm-hmm. like kind of floppy like. And I went through, what, 10 months or eight, eight or 10 months uh, without a repair uh, Achilles. And then once I got released from the Raiders and I still was injured, I got a second opinion, which I should have got first mm-hmm. <laughs> or eight months ago. Uh, he told he looked at the guy, looked across the room and was like, yeah, I got to go in there and fix that. He didn't get no x-rays, no MRIs or nothing. And he, he could tell me exactly what was wrong with it before, like, without looking at it. Mm-hmm. He was like, man, that's, like, that's crazy. I should have came to you a long time ago. I'd probably be able to still play. <laughs> yeah. Um, do, you, do you still uh, feel like, does, does it still bother you at all? Or is it completely healed? Uh, it still bothers me every now and again. But uh, I, don't, I don't really do too much running on it just because of, I hurt my back a little while ago in these car accidents. <laughs> so I haven't really been doing too much working out. Yep. I mean, I can believe that. Um, so I read that the article that was about you a couple weeks ago, I think it was July 10th um, of this past year. And you were talking about how you you're, how you kind of struggled um, with depression after, after um, the injury. So I wanted to talk to you about that and, how did you kind of get through that, and what was that time like for you personally? Um, honestly, I'm still working on it. To be real with you, it's, and it's not something that you can just snap back and fix right away. It's something that you have to constantly work on because any moment you can fall back into that that depression or that pit. But at the moment, of what I'm doing is I have a therapist I talk to on a weekly mm-hmm. basis, and before I met her. I was just lost and out there. And I think, no, I think I know once I was able to meet with somebody and, and talk and deal with things that wasn't a part of my family members, that's what really helped me. So, like, I'm a big advocate for mm-hmm. people going to So, that kind of hmm And honestly, so- I think it should be included in people's medical bills. Like, <laughs> We go yeah. see doctors once a year or dentists every six months. Like we need to go see a therapist for our for our heads, at least every every couple of years. Mm-hmm. And when I read that, it kind of, I mean, I'm glad that you kind of shared that because I struggle with depression myself, and I've I've started to go see a therapist, and it's it's really been helping me. Um, and I think a lot of people are going through tough times right now, whether that be family member got sick or you lost your job or just um, the state of everything is stressing you out, and I think it's really important that that people go and talk to talk to people that know what they're doing um, and can help you. And I think that it's real, it's very valuable that you that you brought that up and uh, you shared your story. Yeah, appreciate that. 
Yeah, for sure. So, um, do you think? Do you kind of look back at that at that injury as something that maybe helped you become a better person in terms of like uh, teaching you how to go through adversity or anything of that nature? Like, I know it's a no. it's a bad situation. <laughs> no. <laughs> you say no. Nah, you just if you look at my background, that's that's all I've been doing was fighting through diversity. Just coming from Connecticut and and working my way on every depth chart on every team that I played for. And that's all I've been dealing with was adversity. I was I, I was hoping I'd be done with it once I got to the NFL. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I don't I don't think that it helped me become a better person. I just change the path that I was on. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wanted to go back to mental health one uh, one last time before we transition to another thing. Uh, how do you feel that uh, mental health is kind of looked at from people who don't experience it at all, don't experience depression or anxiety or things of that nature? Because I feel like, um, like for me, if I tell someone about like what I'm going through or whatever, they don't really understand and they're like, well, you don't have anything to be depressed about something like that so do you think what do you think about the stigma of mental health and and depression and all that i mean i feel like everybody depressed at some point in life just because of anything whether you know it or not or how you deal with it they'd be different but when people say oh you have nothing to be depressed about it's like you don't know what's going on in that person's life they Regardless of how your life may be, your mother could have just died yesterday, like, <laughs> or like, or something just little, like, not little, but something big like that could be going on in your life, and a person on the outside that doesn't know you won't know that. So, mm-hmm. I, I honestly, I try to, I try not to do, make those assumptions on people or anybody that I'm dealing with, just because you never know what's going on with anybody's life. Mm-hmm. So how do you kind of like if you can't co- go and see the therapist? What do you? What are some things that you do that you think other people should do? Like when you're down to try to help out your mood? Um, try and find a hobby. Like I, I used to go, used to go to the range when I uh, was able to. But uh, now I just usually just play with my dogs. I, I'm breeding Yorkies, so I usually just focus on them when I'm kind of stressed out. They kind of take my they take my mind off mm-hmm. the thing. Yeah, because dogs are always happy. Exactly. Right? How can you be up, be upset when you got this dog? You got three dogs jumping in your face trying to kiss you. Yeah. Right? I let them, <laughs> but they try. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I want to talk about life after football, after the injury, um, and when you kind of started to get a little bit better. What? What thoughts did you have in terms of the next career path, um, where life would take you next? Um, honestly, I just was jumping around, trying things. It's like I had no no anchors on me, so I was free to do whatever I wanted. So th- this past year, I've been uh, going to massage therapy school. And then once I'm finished with that, I'm thinking about moving to L.A. to uh, continue trying to act, because I was in a few movies and TV shows a couple years ago, and I enjoyed that. So, I think those two things are I'm going to look into my next career path is acting and being a massage therapist. It's kind of weird, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, what was your major at Purdue, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, organizational leadership and supervision, the big OLS. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so, how, how important do you think it is for athletes, um, say, right now, or the ones that are in high school looking to go to the, looking to play at the D1 level, how important do you think it is for them to realize that fo- you can't play football forever? Um, I forget what the average NFL uh, career is. I think it's like three years maybe or something like that. 2.5. 2.5? Yeah. So how important do you think it is for them, and what advice would you have um, for up-and-coming guys in terms I mean, of? Yeah, yeah, that's that statement is, is pounded into your head so much as an athlete like you know it's just you always think you're going to be the one to beat those odds and regardless if you are the one that beat those odds like I've met guys that played 10-12 years 
and still don't know what to do once they finish <laughs> finish yeah. playing football. They just sit at home and be bored all day. So I really encourage guys to figure out who you are outside of the game, and that will take you wherever you need to go. Mm -hmm. Did you think about that at all um, at Purdue? No, not at all, because my life was focused on football, being around football. And again, I I thought I was one of those guys that was going to beat the odds. But again, I never thought, all right, even if I did beat those odds, what am I going to do after that? <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, it, I'm really I'm just now figuring out what I like to do outside of football. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean I've seen you do a bunch of different things. You're also a model as well. <laughs> I, I wouldn't call myself a model, but I've never been. It. <laughs> <laughs> what was that part you cut out? Say it again. I so said, what did you just say? I, it cut out for a second. Oh, I said, I wouldn't call myself a model, but I've dabbled in it. Yeah. So, um, you also write. Is that right? Yes. Correct. So, what do you um, what do you do with that, and how do you think that – does that help you kind of express yourself in any way? Um, yeah. It, I kind of – whenever I get, like, a lot of, I say, emotions or frustrations going on in my mind, Writing a story about it sometimes helps me out. So mm -hmm. that's what led me to like starting starting to write and do things like that and publishing books. And I enjoyed it. So that's why it helps me. Helps me like settle down and clears my mind and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then how did you get into acting and um, dabbling in modeling? Um... Honestly, I was just bored one day and went on the went on the website and received a casting call and went and see what it was about. And it was a movie that here in uh, Orlando. I don't remember the movie name of it, but uh, I enjoyed doing it. <laughs> so then I started I started working on it and I was able to get into uh, the Fox show Star uh, Star, and then I was in a movie mm -hmm. called Mile Twenty Two. And then I was in on an uh, extra in, on, in the Ozarks, but they cut that scene. <laughs> they cut it. Yeah. I haven't watched a whole lot of Ozarks, but I know that uh, a lot of people like it. What were you doing there? I was a waiter. Oh, you're a waiter. Yeah. But they, I, well, I watched it. My, uh, my lady just had me uh, start watching. To be honest with you, I want to say during this whole quarantine thing. And I was looking, I was like, this the scene, but uh, I ain't in it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so before I let you go, like I said, I'm, I'm a little pressed for time. But going forward next year, um, I don't know how much you follow Purdue now um, since you've been away from West Lafayette. But how do you see the next, the next year, few years going for uh, Purdue in terms of, I mean, we've gotten some great recruits. Jeff Rom's doing an incredible job recruiting and uh, building this team. So do you think that, like, a Big Ten championship could be in the future for Purdue? Uh, I don't know. You have to see how the, how the building blocks come together because, again, with all this COVID stuff, we don't know what's happening. <laughs> mm -hmm. Some guys might leave early and just like the hell with the season. Guys might transfer. Guys might come in. So I don't know, to be honest with you. I still wanna, I'm, I'm excited to see what's happening, though. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for coming on uh, I know I'm not going to grab it right now but your jersey's hanging up on my wall back there <laughs> um, from, from when I was little I got it when I was like eight maybe Oh wow! That's when, yeah that's when you were <laughs> when I was like eight or nine I think um, so I've looked up to you for a long time uh, you were one of the first guys that I kind of looked up to an athlete that I that I admired you and like uh, Jeter and Peyton Manning, actually. I like, we're like my three <laughs> first favorite athletes. Um, thank so, thank uh, you. Uh, it means a lot to you. Appreciate that, man. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Take care down there. You too. Be safe. Yep. Peace out, everybody. Later.